I begin this uh, webinar by acknowledging the traditional custodians of all the lands on which we meet. I also acknowledge our gratitude that we share these lands today, our sorrow for the costs of that sharing, and our hope that we can move in unity to an Australia that is fair and just for all its Indigenous peoples. And uh, the uh, YCW prayer, which is really a worker's prayer, Lord Jesus, a worker like me, help me and all my fellow workers to think like you, to work with you, to pray through you, to live in you, to give you all my strength and all my time. May your kingdom come in all our factories, farms, workshops, offices, and in all our homes. Be everywhere better known, better loved, better served. Deliver us forever from injustice and hatred, from evil and sin. May our souls remain in your grace today. And may the soul of every worker who died on Labor's battlefield rest in peace. Amen. Thanks very much for that, Brian. I think that was a great way to introduce this meeting uh, because it's going to be all about the role and the importance of the whole YCW method uh, and linked to the whole experience of an initiative of world. Blah, 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 blah. Start again. Thanks very much, Brian. That was a great way to begin the meeting, I think, because uh, the whole meeting tonight will be about the importance of the YCW formation method and the way it was lived out by Bill Armstrong, uh, first of all, as a leader of the YCW itself, and then later uh, in his work in the field of international development in Australia and elsewhere. Uh, for those that don't know Bill, well, you'll learn more about him tonight, but uh, he was originally probably most well known as an Australian rules footballer with Carlton in the old Victorian Football League. But basically he gave that up uh, to become involved, more involved as a full-time worker and extension worker for the YCW in Melbourne and in Geelong and elsewhere, I think also in Western Australia. And uh, that's been a formative, what was a formative experience for his whole life, which shaped the way he worked in other fields later, particularly the field of international development, with Australian Volunteers International. And Bill's the biography has just been published. It's authored by Peter Britton, who worked for 30 years with Bill uh, at AVI, and is particularly well-placed uh, to know lot Bill's story and to document it. Um, Peter originally uh, was an expert in the field of, uh, on Indonesian history and politics, particularly on the role of the Indonesian army in that country. Um, and after working as a writer and publicist for a few years, in the, he returned to Indonesia as a volunteer uh, and soon after became a staff member of AVI, leading to his long partnership with Bill. So he's also written other books, including an institutional history of AVI, AVI working for the world. So that's another thing you may wish to look up after tonight's event. But our host tonight will be Dr. Jean Kerr Walsh, who has been a longtime friend of both Bill and his wife, Margaret Armstrong. Uh, in fact, they, she says they were his mentors uh, back in the late 1960s as Melbourne and national YCW leaders. And she's also known Peter for many years through her own involvement with, with AVI. In fact, in 1999, she was commissioned to do a communications audit of the old Overseas Service Bureau, as it used to be known, and in fact, uh, proposed the name change to Australian Volunteers International. And later, she also served as a director on the board. Since then, she's had developed a lot of experience as a, as a broadcast journalist and a political advisor and strategic communications consultant. Um, since retiring, uh, she's maintained her commitment in the field of social justice, and uh, um, particularly uh, she's involved with the Kranlana Centre for Ethical Leadership, a non-profit partnership with Monash University, committed to developing practical reason, wisdom and ethical behaviour in corporate community and public service, public sector leaders. She's also been co-chair of Grandmothers for Refugees. So I think she also brings a lot of experience to this whole evening tonight. And so without further ado, I'll hand over to Jean to facilitate the rest of our event. Thanks very much, Jean. Thanks very much, Stefan. Um, and Stefan, we'd actually like to see you. We're seeing your screen at the moment. So you might like to 
um, let us see you too. Um, all right, um, thanks very much for that intro. And I just thought that I'd say a little bit about how we might approach this time that we've got together, that um, I'll ask um, Bill and Peter um, some probing questions, hopefully, that will help them to talk a little bit about what you can expect to see when you buy and read this book. Um, I have to say I found it a page turner, and that was largely because uh, the early chapter was very much um, early chapters about Bill's early life and then about the YCW, and then you get a real thread that goes through the rest of the book. And I hope that we're able in the conversation that um, I might um, lead with, with Bill and Peter, give you a sense of some of that. And then at about at least a um, you know, quarter to the hour, we'll, um, we'll hand over to you for any questions that you might then have that are prompted by the conversation that we have had or things that we've perhaps left out that you would like to, um, like to hear about. So, um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up if we peter out the conversation, so to speak, or, um, and we can go on a little bit longer. <coughs> perhaps, um, we're in Stefan's hands, Stefan's hands about that. So um, this is a, a truly uh, terrific book, Everything and Nothing. And, um, you know, Peter is the wordsmith. And I do have to say, Peter, it is beautifully written. And, um, and I'm wondering because um, your prior authorial works have actually focused on political and institutional history. Um, that's your background. And I think this, I'm right in that this is your first biographical work. So how difficult was it to switch um, to this work of biography? It was certainly a change of scene and a, and a change, of, uh, change of method. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, you'd expect it to be different. Um, I guess with my earlier, earlier books, I've actually had to uh, negotiate the engagement. I've had to... Uh, I've had differing levels of support. Uh, sometimes I've had to negotiate access to people and archival resources. Sometimes I've had to actually work around attempts to stop me telling the story that I was trying to tell. So how different could it be when you're actually invited uh, to take on writing a biography of somebody that you know well? Well, the door was wide open. Uh, so very different in that case. Not only was it open, we also had a, well, not in it, but we, we worked very quickly towards an agreed understanding about what it was to be about and why, why we were doing it. It was fairly early on. I was telling a former colleague that uh, I started working on this. He said, oh, that's great. Uh, the aid industry needs, needs a hero. Haven't got any. Well, he was wrong on two counts, yeah? Um, Bill doesn't actually associate himself with the aid industry, and the book was certainly never intended to portray him as a hero. Um, what we worked out between us was that uh, this was a chance to investigate and reveal uh, what made Bill's activism, yeah? uh, to reveal his theory of change, uh, his ideas and his methods. Uh, what he did, what he thought, um, and that, how that changed and developed, you know, over, over years. I mean, in the time that I worked with Bill, which was 18 years, not the 30, although the 30, obviously, I've known Bill for all of that. Um, and in the time I worked with him, I mean, I saw him as a really respected leader in that development field. So my task became really how to... Uh, tease this out, how, how to, uh, to work out how he came to that kind of rights-based activism that characterised his, his, his work and his reputation and his social and personal approach to that activism. Yeah? So, and, and then, of course, to present that story in a contextualised narrative that hopefully people could access. Yeah. So very different to... Uh, navigating my way around either Indonesian intelligence or the former AVI board. Well, we'd like to hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, let me go to you, Bill. Um, you, know, you, don't, you don't need to have... 
we might we might just Wang McGough, hello, and we might ask you to just mute your microphone, Wayne, if that's possible. Um, Bill, I was going to say that you don't need Peter or me, any one of us, to you know pump up your tires. Um, what was your motivation in seeing your life experiences placed on the record in this way? Oh, Jean, I think uh, on a number of occasions over the years, people have uh, have asked me or suggested that I should write my story. I guess that was because I'd been involved in you know quite a large number of alphabet alphabetic organisations, um, organise uh, in the aid and development field, um, and I had thought about that long and hard for a long time. But one of the things that I uh, came round to was how important it was or is uh, still today to promote a, uh, a development philosophy and methodology that is really about development, that is about developing people uh, instead of it being about aid. Uh, and, um, and I thought that... Uh, by writing my own ex or having my own experience uh, written, uh, it might be possible for that to be used to reintroduce, because I think that's what it is, to reintroduce that, that method, that, that way of working, which is about developing people. And of course, uh, I learned that through Cardine's YCW. That's where I learned it. I mean, the YCW was my uh, was my university, uh, and um, and so I felt that that story was well worth telling, uh, particularly if it can be used to uh, to encourage other people to take on that uh, that approach. So you were really wanting this to be a, a pedagogical work, really. Yeah, very much because. Uh, the thing that's not realised, I think, uh, and hasn't, I think in my time in the YCW, I'm not sure that we really understood that that's what it was. It was, um, it was a, a learning experience. It was a methodology to train people, to form people, to form leaders. Uh, while you took action, of course, and it was action, reflection, and uh, see, judge, and act, and everything, the, the fundamental thing behind it was training leaders for the future, for life. So, Bill, before we actually go there, because you weren't born into the world as a YCW leader, it actually did start at Alexandria, um, Alexandra in um, rural Victoria. So let's go back there where the book itself starts. And I want to ask you, Peter, in researching that part of Bill's life, his early years, um, what did you learn about Bill from understanding his early life as a child and then as a young man. Um, and what did you see there that you then recognised in his life trajectory, so to speak? Yeah, sure. Oh, look, I think there are a, a couple of factors in Bill's early life that were really, uh, really very strong influences. And far and away the most important was his mother. Um, I mean, she was somebody who had a tough life, but her world revolved around providing for, for Bill and his, and his brother Bernie. She was this sort of constant role model of, of uh, uh, being caring and hospitable, yeah? um, absolutely people-centred, somebody that always saw the best in people. The result is that Bill became somebody that liked people. He was good at listening to them, uh, good at drawing them to him harnessing them, uh, getting them involved in the things that he thought were important. Um, and that's certainly a thread that has you know, been there from a very early time right through to now. Mm -hmm. The other feature, is another one if I can, is just that, because it was also fairly on, was this sense of responsibility. Uh, now, Bill's situation on the farm, the work to be done there, the farm's location, outside of Alexandria, but not too far away. So he was within reach of it, being the elder brother. All of these things meant that Bill had lots of opportunities to take responsibility. Uh, now, I'm sure there were exceptions to it, but for most of the part, when he talks about it, 
I think he enjoyed it and, and he, he reveled in taking responsibility because, in a sense, it's uh, being in a position to make things happen. Is that right, Bill? Oh, yeah, it probably is when you, when you look back. But, I mean, there was a sense of living... I mean, the idea of growing up on a farm in a country area, the freedom you had to to move around, to to know people in the play in the place, uh, to um, not be locked down too too much. Uh, there was a lot of freedom there, but there was also, uh, as Peter has said, there was a lot of responsibility: milking cows, dipping sheep, mustering sheep, all that sort of stuff, which. Um, um, which I, I guess when I look back on it, I did enjoy it. I, uh, I didn't see it all as hard work. I, uh, um, and, and that did flow over to, uh, as a 13-year-old, I think, 12 or 13, 14, 13-year-old, playing, foot, playing cricket with the Alexandra footballers and, uh, and then starting our own little football club. And so having the... Res- I mean, the early, those early days, I suppose, um, softened me up or whatever it was for what happened in the YCW as a 15-year-old being able to take responsibility. Well, let's go to the YCW years then. What, what was the appeal of the YCW, YCW to you as a 15-year-old? Cricket. Okay. I to play cricket. <laughs> well, I was invited to play cricket. Uh, that's how it happened. Uh, I, I turned 15. Um, a friend of mine that I was at school with uh, said, Would you want to come down and have a game of cricket? So the YCW, my journey with the YCW began with the sport, cricket, basketball, football, uh, and all that. And uh, the Friday night meeting, playing British Bulldog in, a, in an old army hut, trying to knock each other out. Uh, all that sort of thing was uh, great fun. That that's where the YCW uh, organisation started for me. So, in actual fact, uh, let's situate this in time. The YCW had been present in Australia for about ten years. So, we're talking about you connecting with it in 1951. About that, would that be about right? 51, yeah, yeah. 50, 51. And so, yeah, the, yeah, the YCW had been present and growing for about a decade. And yep. so the, the sporting and social activities were the things that were drawing young people to the movement, yeah? Well, in those days, young people of that age group uh, didn't have, uh, there weren't sporting clubs as there are today. Mm-hmm. There weren't social events as there are today. Uh, you, uh, you, you had to make your own. Uh, you really did have to... Uh, go and become involved in it. And that's, I think, was so easy for the YCW to to draw young people in. I mean, I, I just think it's tragic today that, that there's so much of all that has been taken over by, by money-making machines and people and adults and so on. And, and young people today, it's very, very hard to take that sort of, be given or take that sort of responsibility until you're in your early 20s, uh, and and those years are missed out. But uh, it was very easy uh, back in those days for us. And, of course, you mention adults and their influence on young people now, but adults were an important part of the YCW, um, everything and nothing. Uh, um, who, were the, who were the adults who were your mentors or the ones who had the most impact on you in those early days that were taking you towards a leadership role within the YCW? In actual fact, in my case, uh, we didn't have uh, any, the adults, people, the older ones in in my case were the older YCW members, actually. They were uh, around the the 20 years of age, 21, 22, five, six, seven, eight years older than me. They were the ones that that I looked up to. They were the ones that... uh, ultimately invited me to become a team member and then to become a leader in, in the organisation. Uh, we didn't have a, we actually didn't have a chaplain. We had a, a priest in the parish who was hostile to the YCW, quite frankly. 
Uh, but there were other priests and other uh, adults in the YCW as we got to know other other branches and the, the, uh, the Melbourne movement, of course. And what was the the time or the pivotal moment when you actually thought there's something really special here? Um, this is more than just the footy and the cricket and the things that I can do in my leisure time. I don't know. You can't I, really, I really don't know. I I think it was it was just flowed on. I I, I mean uh, I learned a lot about the YCW from what Peter Britton wrote in that book. Uh, I uh, we should uh, read it then. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I uh, I mean, I I lived the YCW. I I experienced it, and I, and I uh, I wasn't of a habit of uh, looking back at those things, and um, so I'm not quite sure. I I suppose I mean one really big influence was in 1957 when I got the opportunity to go to Rome. And uh, as part of the uh, the pilgrimage group from Australia to go to the first international council, and that that happened to me even before I became a member of the the uh, the, the Melbourne executive. Uh, so um, I mean, uh, I, I when I reflect on it, Gene, I find it very hard to pick up those pivotal uh, points. Mm. So you go um, internationally at that stage to Rome um, and it was the first of, of um, other, you know, international experiences. God knows the later in life you spend all your time in airports. We know that. Um, but that's those first international experiences. What did that say to you as a young person? 57, you would have been, you know, 2021. 20, I was yeah. 21. Oh, I think it um, uh, it was a, an experience that, uh, first of all, I was with a group of 57 uh, Australians on the ship that we, we headed off on. So there was the, the camaraderie and, uh, and all that, and we were all part of the same movement and talking the same language and so on. And so there was all that. Um, and then... Uh, then of course we hit Cape Town because we went round uh, the went round past South Africa because we couldn't go through the Suez Canal and we had a day where we were slapped in the face with apartheid and um, uh, and that was an incredible learning experience for me. I, I probably it was a culture shock, but uh, you know to wander through a town where there were black uh, were white only seats and white only toilets and and uh, and Borgie, one of our mates who was a Maltese extraction from from Queensland, it was very very dark uh, because he was a cane cutter. Uh, got on the bus and had to produce his passport to prove he was white. You know that sort of experience uh, uh, had a hell of an impact. And then of course meeting people from Africa and Asia in Rome and so on. But of course. Uh, uh, showed me that there was a world out there, but there was a world of people who were all concerned about the right thing, concerned about looking after one another, concerned about uh, taking action for change. And the fact that it was global action, did that um, really have an impact on you then? No, I don't. I don't think it did because I think I was thinking much more of change at home and change in our and individual change, personal change, but that lot all these people were involved in the same sort of thing. I, at that stage, uh, I wasn't aware so much, and I'm not sure even the YCW was aware so much of international uh, uh, change and programs. And so do you think it became more aware when you came back after pilgrimage to Rome and did it influence the Australian YCW at that time? Um, yeah, to some degree it did, I, I think. I, um, I think it, uh, we were fairly isolated we, at, at, that, at that stage. I mean, a little bit later on after I moved, moved on from the YCW in the, uh, the latter part of the 60s, 
and some of the people that are on this webinar are aware of that, uh, I think Australia became much more involved internationally than we were before. Although we were on the, we were on the move, we'd made the contacts, we'd made the links. Mm. I think it'd be fair to say, Bill, um, that you're not an academic man. Um, and yet, I know from reading the book that you paid close attention to the to the likes of Paolo Freire and Ivan Illich. Um, at what time were you looking at what they were having to say and particularly um, taking a, a particular interest in experiential learning in the, you know, well, you know, Freire called it the pedagogy of the oppressed? I don't think that I was um, conscious of those people so much until a decade or so after I'd left the YCW. Uh, I began to become aware of them in the in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s. I, I started to become aware of uh, the development philosophy around the world. When the world development movement in in London, when uh, uh, when the churches uh, internationally were talking about development and looking at the whole uh, the whole business of causes of uh, poverty and underdevelopment rather than just trying to treat the uh, treat the poverty and I, I guess then I started to take sit up and take notice and you know someone like Ivan Illich uh, I uh, you're right I'm not an academic I haven't read a hell of a lot uh, I'm um, I've been very cunning about my reading. I read the right lines or someone tells me which lines to read. And I've done a lot of that in my life. But, you know, Ivan Illich, I can still remember Ivan Illich uh, when he came to Australia making a comment that you never learn anything you don't already know. Now, you can't say that's absolute truth, but there's a hell of a truth in that. And that is you experience things and then you learn what you've experienced. Uh, it's a methodology. It's the experiential methodology of learning, which uh, we've lost today. I mean, accountants, lawyers, nurses, all those sort of people worked on the line, worked in the job, and then did the theory. Today, we do the theory and think we know it all, which is a real turnaround of our educational philosophy. And then, of course, the Cardine there was so much of card on. You can talk about the Sea Judge and Act, and and of course, every day you start again. In other words, you've never finished. You're always learning. You're always moving forward. It's a continual rotation, as um, as Freire talks about action, reflection, act. You act. You reflect. You act. Uh, those sorts of things became very important, and of course. A little bit later in life, I became very conscious of the Cardine thing of the priest is everything and the priest is nothing. And then realized that that is so fundamental to development that the, the development worker, nothing really happens unless the development worker brings people together, encourages people, facilitates things. But then... Uh, the most important, that's, that's important, but the most important thing is the development worker is not the one that does it. The people have to do it because they've got to have that experience and they've got to learn from that. And so that um, everything and nothing is just so fundamental to development. Mm. You've, you've segued us um, from your YCW experience, but we all know you didn't ever go back to your fitter and turning. Um, uh, no good at it. <laughs> you were happy to leave that behind you. And yeah, no, I, I was no good at it. I was when I was working for the YCW. Well, theoretically, working for the YCW in Geelong as an extension worker and working on the assembly line at General at uh, International Harvester. Uh, I think this is in the book. Uh, I uh, I got a job there because I, uh, I I had to earn some money, but I was really working for the YCW. And the guy that uh, big time uh, knight of the Southern Cross, I think he must have been, had got me a job at uh, at International Harvester. Uh, he reported back to Toomey 
Father Toomey, that I talked too much. Um, in the tour room, I was obviously known as the person who talked too much and didn't do enough work. <laughs> well, well we, that we all know you and we can identify with that. We wouldn't be surprised. Um, <laughs> I want to just go back to Peter for a little. Peter, in this transition <laughs> from, you know, YCW uh, to then uh, into the development space, you know, volunteer, volunteering, you know, volunteers yep. abroad and so on. Yep. By doing the, the research that you did, and I understand actually about the research, you got a lot of it out of the garage. Is that right, at Marg and Bill's place? <laughs> I think it ended up in the garage. Um, but a lot of it came out of Bill's then study and filing okay. cabinets and so on. Yeah, vast amounts of it. Yeah. Correspondence and meeting reports and so on, a lot of it. Some of it even tattered pieces of paper clippings, you know, from the 60s. So he kept lots of stuff. He kept, yeah? he kept okay. lots of stuff. Well, that's that's a boon for the biographer. And, uh, and uh, it was an absolute boon. It was a gold mine. And, so uh, when when you were actually then looking at this period of his of his life where he's shifting from you know YCW into this very different field, what are your observations about what he actually took with him? I mean, what made him the right sort of person to get that job with the Overseas Service Bureau? And um, well, before and before that, yeah, yeah, and 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 through that time, because yeah, he, he, ne he never left it alone. Actually, um, it. I mean, the the way Bill describes YCW as his university, you know, it's certainly the way he was formed through those experiences was fundamental to his work in development. Absolutely, and there are countless. Uh, episodes where I can sort of see that what he was doing was operating from first principles. It wasn't operating from any knowledge of the country or the context of what was happening, just the first principles of what people are saying, you know, listening to them, um, rather than trying to apply any kind of predetermined strategy that fitted a, uh, somebody else's development goal, you know. Um, so this stress on listening to people, learning from them, uh, he knew that you know, the development of people's, you know, of their own communities was always under threat. It was always under threat by structures of oppression, by uh, you know violations of their rights or impingements on their rights, and so on. So, um, and and that really became much more important later on in his career too. You know, um, but. It, Throughout, he emphasised participation, enabling people to do that, inviting them to do that, but always without letting go of the uh, responsibility of leadership. He wasn't shy of robust debate. You know, he'd, he'd take people on. Um, and as, you know, new trends in thinking emerged, he had this sort of ability to just accommodate them into the framework that he'd, that he'd taken from YCW. So reflective evaluation, appreciative inquiry. And they were just sort of natural fits with, with what he'd, he'd already learned. They were just different, a different language, different sets of terminology and so on. So, Bill, other, yeah, go ahead, Peter. Yeah. So there's another key thing, I think, that was a, a YCW learning, uh, particularly from Cardine, I suspect, um, and that was the importance of communicating profound complex concepts in really simple language. Um, so, uh, I mean, it, once he was embedded in, in, uh, in the volunteer program, and making, setting its, its direction, he came up with his slogan to describe the role of Australian volunteers, live, work and learn. It was classic card mm. mm. Yeah. Bill, were you doing that quite deliberately? Oh yeah, to some degree. I uh, I was always aware that uh, that the sort of language in the not for profit area, in the NGO area, in the field of aid and development, and so on, uh, it was very easy to become stale on on the one hand, but also uh, not only stale. But I used to watch as government would take over that language and use it, for, and other people would take over that language and use it for different purposes 
not the purpose for which, you know, we, we were using it. And so I was always conscious that it was a good idea to keep trying to, um, I, trying to uh, change the language. I used to, I think, say that uh, I learned that in my football field. You've got to keep moving. If you don't keep moving around on the ground, you get clobbered. So you've got to keep moving. Mm-hmm. Um, and how important was that when you were dealing with some fairly fancy footwork kind of characters in your time and of leadership? I mean, we, we haven't got time to go through it all here, and why would we? Because we know that people will want to read it in the book. Um, but all the time that you spent with ACFOA, you know, at the national level, um, the engagement that you had with government and with ministers particularly, do you want to talk about that, um, you know, you've got to keep moving? How did that help you in the relationships that you tried to have with government through ministers who were responsible for the aid sector? Oh, I think... I think going back to the old, to the YCW uh, basis, you know, that you you needed to learn, you needed to build relationships. Uh, you, um, you had to uh, ask them who they were. You had to uh, find out how they were feeling and uh, how they were going with the job. And uh, it doesn't matter who they were, you... Uh, you you got on. You find out what football team they play. They barrack for, or you uh, you know we were taught, and I can still remember going into um, Warnerbull. I think it was on a visit, and I'd been briefed by somebody before I went as to what I should do. I had to drive around the town and find out what the company, what businesses were in town, and so that was that gave me a chance to ask some questions. Do any of you work in that big factory down the road? What is it? So. I mean that that's just so fundamental to to everything in life, and if you do that, um, some of those uh, heavies at the top end they get a bit thrown, of course, when you start when you start off with that. They don't expect to uh, to, but uh, it's the way I the way I think uh, you have to operate. Uh, and, um, and the other the other thing that I always felt about. Uh, the heavies in government was uh, make it make it your business to get to know their PAs, their secretaries. Um, that's far more important than getting to know them. Mm. Uh, and you've got access to a lot more when you do that. Mm. I'm sure that there are people um, in the webinar tonight who would recognise that, and the words that we would use in the YCW, you always start where the young people are at. You start where they're at. And really, that's true for people of any age, isn't it? That in engagement with them, you start where people are at. Well, I'm going to pause our conversation here and then open it up to the others who are in the virtual room with us. Um, I think I can sort of see all of you um, on the screen. If that, some of you would like to turn your um, your cameras on and we can see all of you, just in case you want to be able to ask a question. But... Um, let's ask not very long questions, if I can um, suggest that way, so that we can give Peter and Bill time to um, get through as many questions as possible and for Peter and Bill also not to give us very long answers. Let's see how we go. Would anyone like to put a question that's been raised by um, the conversation so far or something that, that hasn't been raised that you'd like to hear about? Ching. Yes, Wayne. One of the things that struck me about the big book bill as I read through it was, yes, there was a structure, but under, underneath there was this constant gathering of friends at barbecues, all sorts of other gatherings who would get together, form, form, find they were on the same path and then act. There was this informality and spontaneity. Uh, yes, there was a structure, but the, the, the thing that kept adding, to me, that kept adding vitality was this spontaneity and comradeship and, and solidarity, whether it was YSW or any other movement you're in, that got things to move forward. Would you like to comment? Oh, no, Wayne, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that the YCW uh, gave me was uh, um, uh, hundreds of friends and, and also not just YCW, but Sorry, also... Sorry, Bill, let me just interrupt you for a moment. Wayne, could you go on mute again because we're getting feedback from your microphone 
Thank yeah. you. I mean, most of the jobs that I had gave me the chance to meet uh, some fantastic people all around the country and internationally, of course, as well. But the YCW uh, uh, group that I I worked with and got to know uh, over the years has been uh, a constant group of support and friendship over the years. And, uh, uh, and you know, I... Um, I suppose, um, again, that YCW thing of, of uh, keep, uh, building friendships and building relationships uh, just comes at second nature, I think, to, to most people who have been through that sort of formation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, not a, it's not a chore. It's, uh, uh, it, and, uh, and as you meet those people and you share, well, I mean, Indented Head, which is mentioned in, of course, the book, but Indented Head was a group of uh, and some of the people Gary McDonald and others that are and Brian Moylan and, and others that are on this webinar um, I mean that's where we used to meet we used to change the world every new year we just didn't have a good PA to take the, take the minutes that was the problem <laughs> uh, any other uh, a question another question I'd like to make um, a comment I can make it a question by asking Bill to um, comment on it the transition from um, playing cricket or whatever it was that got us connected with the YCW initially, um, and as you pointed out, it's a, a pity that there isn't that still, the need for it maybe, um, is fundamental really to the uh, development of the people who are enjoying cricket. Um, and uh, Cardon uh, used to say, do before, do with and do after. And I still do that. Um, I was uh, heading up a, um, a community centre for some while. And the one thing I learned very early is that you're going to lose volunteers unless you give them responsibility. And uh, the do with the before and do after is you ask people to do something, give them an understanding of why it's important, reflect on it afterwards, and you've got a leader in the making. Is that right, Bill? That, so that he was saying... He couldn't uh, recall how he went from being a cricketer to being a leader, and he jumped a few. I mean, he was always very ambitious. He <laughs> jumped straight into Rome. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah I, that's really important to me, that, that do before, do with and do others. Absolutely. I mean, that's fundamental to the to that the whole uh, YCW thing, uh, the development thing. Do with do do before do with and do after you know like it's uh, you you're not going to ask people to take on things that you're not prepared to do you've got to, in a sense you've got to be seen to be involved and and committed but at the same time you've got to be able to move aside uh, and make sure that the people are allowed to take responsibility enabled to take responsibility. Mm. Mm. Des, did you have your hand up? Yes, yes. Thank Bill, uh, did you have any contact with His Grace, Dr Mannix? And can you comment on anything there? Oh, no, I didn't. I mean, he was he was around in, in my Ooh. day, of course. I went to communion breakfasts uh, that he spoke at and so on. But, um, but no, he. I didn't really have any direct uh, contact with him, no. Mm -hmm. Bill, one area that we didn't cover was your reconnection with the YCW internationally after you'd actually been um, uh, away from it for quite some time when um, you're a dad and you've got a family. Tell us a little bit about um, your time that you were at the International Secretariat in Brussels. Well, first of all, just to say that I was going through it time in my life at that stage where I felt the need to do some study. I felt the need to have a bit of paper in front of me of some kind. And I actually applied to go to Cunavaca, uh, the Illich thing in, uh, in Latin America. And uh, I got a letter. I, I wrote to Berkey, to Father Brian Burke, Berkey, who was cha international chaplain and he uh, he wrote a letter back which said something like, you don't need to go and do that. Just come here and edit this publication that we've just setting up called Info. So what I did was I 
jokingly but quite seriously said, well, I'm going off to Brussels to learn to read and write. And um, because I had to, um, I had to learn to read and I had to learn to write. Um, and, um, and that's what I did. And it was, a, it was an incredible experience for me because it did force me to, uh, to edit and to write and to write about things that um, I'd never really thought a lot about. I mean, the first publication I edited was about the uh, Allende um, uh, murder in, uh, in Chile, uh, written, the material I got had been written by young workers there. I wrote, uh, I wrote a publication on the impact of uh, inflation on young workers uh, and uh, the impact of, uh, of multinationals in the world. Um, and in order to write those things, I had to read, I had to study, I had to. So um, it gave me a fantastic opportunity to do those things. And uh, it was tough for Marg for a, for a while. I mean, we had four kids at the time uh, and it wasn't easy, but it was an experience that uh, uh, we would, none of us would, uh, would not have taken. Uh, but there's also, I, I was um, thrust into the International Council, the 75 uh, International Council in, uh, in Linz. Uh, and I was there in the YCW at a time when the YCW was beginning to have its tensions with va the Vatican. Uh, and, and, and of course, the YCW, just to say one more thing about that, the YCW, in my view, was always out on the fringe of the church. It was very connected to the social justice teachings and so on of the church. But church leadership always had problems in really quite understanding it um, because it wasn't Catholic enough or wasn't Christian enough or wasn't churchy enough. And that began to, in fact, I had a phone call from uh, Kevin Vaughan, I don't know whether Kevin's on here, but uh, uh, saying that the thing about the book that he was surprised about was how uh, the, at the international level, the Vatican uh, were not happy with what was happening to the YCW because it wasn't Catholic enough. And that was certainly the case back in the 70s and 80s. And Stefan would know more about that now than I do. Mm. Thanks. Now, any further questions that people might have. Could I ask one myself? <clears throat> sure. I'm not, I don't even know if it's possible to give an answer to the question, Bill, but I also work for uh, a development agency responsible for projects in uh, Southeast Asian countries. And uh, <clears throat> I found that uh, the people, most people there obviously had gone through university with uh, you know, studies, masters in international development or some kind of postgraduate degree in that field. But they didn't know the sort of things that you're talking about and that I also had experience of from the YCW, such as this, these formation methods, you know. And uh, it's, it just really struck me very strongly what a gap there was. So I don't know. I don't know if you've got any thoughts on, on how is it possible to bridge that gap between what people learn in their formal kind of study courses and uh, what we learn in the movement. No, I understand what you're saying, Stefan. I, um, at the international level or at the national level now and in the aid and development field now, uh, it's just about impossible for someone like me anyhow to get a job. You would never get a job with the qualifications I, I don't have or have. Uh, and uh, and more and more, the field is being pushed to take on business business uh, uh, processes and so on. And so the people who are in, in responsible for them are not people who have come up through a development field or a formation field like the YCW, but they're people who have come out of universities or have come out uh, have come out of business. Uh, and that, I think, is, is worrying. I mean, it's not that they're not good people. They are good people, but they haven't, uh, they haven't had that experience. And that's why, for me, the, the volunteer program, uh, the uh, ABI volunteer program, is so important because I think that 
has does still and did certainly in our day give people a chance to go back and and, and brief properly they went through the experience the experience of learning from another culture of learning from other people of knowing that they don't know everything uh and uh and and that unfortunately uh, a lot of those organisations have been taken over by government and uh, are much more pushed towards being more like the Peace Corps approach. Um, mm. We're getting, get, um, you know, five minutes to the hour, so I'm going to try and bring us, unless anybody's got a burning question, um, give both Peter and Bill an opportunity. Oh, Wayne, you wanted to ask another question or...? Yeah, really, uh, the last few questions lead back to my original question. Isn't the fundamental problem with um, the whole card on spirituality is that outsiders see it as nebulous? This came to me a couple of years ago. I had a conversation with Monsignor Peter Jeffries, who was now based in Marupna, who's a good friend of Frank's. And he said he used to sort of push it to one side because there wasn't any structure. It just seemed to happen. But then when he started to go from parish to parish, he found out 70 to 80% of his workers in the parish were cardine trained. He then understood because people don't, the, the academics who have no practical background and the church structure people that, who come out of the George Pell tradition, they, they're looking for pieces of paper and structures where in fact the dynam, dynamism, the networking, the contacts, the, they just don't appreciate. And yet, this is the strength of the organisation. It's why it's at the forefront of this renewal in the church. What would you think, Bill? Cool. <laughs> um, I, I think that um, what what your I'm not sure I can answer your question, Wayne. But uh, what it makes me think about is something I said today on a radio program. I was uh, uh, I was on. And that um, is. I'm, I'm sorry, Bill. Again, yes, thanks, Wayne. Thanks. Um, I don't think we have an education system in this country. Uh, what we have is a vocational training system. So, you know, and this is a horrible thing to say in lots of ways. We don't have a system that educates people, that starts with people where they're at and enables them to learn and to grow and to develop, which is what I think education's about. It's what it's the Cardine methodology. It's the free air methodology. We're so hell bent on train on pumping out people for jobs, so that nowadays that's what that's what we call education. Uh, whereas education is about and development is about opening people's minds up, giving people the chance to take responsibility and to learn and to experience, and and we just don't have that. Uh, and that's why uh, I think, you know, when we turn into go to the development field, like Stefan was talking about, people are told there's poverty in the world and we've got to fix it. So we'll go out and fix it. Uh, they haven't learned themselves. They haven't had that experience of learning themselves so much. So they don't really understand how you do that and encourage others to go through that same process. And yeah, anyhow, you can go on and on and on about that. <laughs> well, let's stick with it a little, and it's not a bad way to sort of wind things up. Peter, you actually picked up on what, you know, some elements of what Bill was talking about there. And I'm going to um, a, a page in the book, and this is you writing, Peter, about um, what Bill was saying, and you used this, um, these words, that within the development sector, his simple profound and accessible vision stood out. In essence, the vision held that development is not something anyone can do to anyone else. Development is a process in which all participate, but can be thwarted by poverty, injustice, racism, and any violation of human rights. So Peter, you've really, I think, encapsulated something there that is an essence, not just to the book, but to Bill's life. But it's more than that. It's about all our lives and the world that we live in. Peter, can you just 
comment about on on that or or even add to that particular phrase that you know development is not something anyone can do to anyone else and the your observations about um the way bill lived that <clears throat> yeah and um, it's it, it was difficult i think for bill to live that because he he, he wasn't really in a friendly environment uh, it was quite a hostile environment because most of the organisations that were, uh, you know, our, our colleagues for, for so long identified themselves as part of, a, of an aid program. Uh, they did see development as something that they could do for somebody else. Um, so it was fund, uh, fundamentally different. And it, in a sense, I think uh, the challenge for us that we still haven't, uh, haven't come near resolving is to come up with a language and, and, and concepts to replace development. Because I think these days, if you talk about development, you're immediately talking about power imbalances between people that have got something to give and people that need something. Mm. Uh, yeah. And we need to lift ourselves out of that. Mm. Uh, and I like to think of it more in terms of uh, you know, international relations from a community perspective. Uh, you know, foreign relations are too important to be left to governments. The, the, the communities have, have, have a right to be involved. And one of the key things is to identify groups and organisations overseas doing stuff that's important in their own communities that you want to support. So I, I'm more interested in returning to the idea of solidarity on a, on a broader scale, but uh, it's going against the flow. Well, we always knew as young workers that it was that whatever change was going to come about, it was for young workers and by young workers. Yeah. And Bill, I think that perhaps, you know, I might be taking a leap, but I suspect not, that underpinned your attitude really to community development wherever it happened, internationally, in the Pacific where, you know, your own involvement, we haven't talked about that in detail, but was significant and in our own country when, you know, through Australian Volunteers International, you were really leading and making room for us to see that development needed to happen in our own country at the invitation of those who um, would, you know, wanted to see change in their own lives, that, again, it wasn't something that could be done to people. Um, so... Would you just give us some final reflections, perhaps drawing a little bit on your more recent career involvements and also your post-way journey, um, where with your time with Indigenous Australians and the significance of um, the work that you were able to do and even give us a little clue about how you think things might go in the future? <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, well, I think that um, the last 20 years... Uh, after I retired the first time to having retired now about a year ago, I think, um, I learned, I, I again was able to experience uh, or put into practice, particularly with the East Timor stuff, which is in the book. I, I don't need to go into that. Uh, Action Aid, the uh, Action Aid was an organisation that actually understood this philosophy but try, and and then some years ago started to change so that um, uh, so that they recognised that change had to take place in Britain and Europe and America and uh, and and so on. Um, but the the thing that struck home to me very very clearly in the last few years is how much the Indigenous community of this country, the first peoples of this country, understand and live that sort of philosophy. There are two aspects of First Nations people in this country that, uh, that we need to understand and we need to learn from. One is the importance of community, the absolute vit vitally importance of living in and living for and with a community. We're all individuals. We're taught to be individuals. 
uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people of this country, uh, it's just second nature. They are part of a community. And we've tried desperately to destroy that in the 200 years, and we've failed to destroy it. We've made inroads on it, but that's so fundamental to them. And the second thing they understand very clearly is that they are responsible for their own situation. They are responsible to bring about the change. We keep on getting in the bloody way. We keep on doing things to them or for them that they don't need or don't want. And so when we come to the voice, it's a, it's a really good understanding of how we, as a country, we're, we're grappling with the voice. I mean, why? I mean, people are asking so stupid questions about why do they need a voice? Why haven't they? Why do we do that? I mean, it is just so fundamental. If you're going to do something to us, if it's anything to do with us, if it's about us, then it's got to be with us. I mean, that's that's pretty simple, basic stuff. But unfortunately, it is very hard for people trained, formed through our education and political and social system to be able to come to grips with that. And yet that's fundamental, not just for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people, it's fundamental for all of us. If it's about us, then we should be involved in it and we should have a voice. Uh, let's start by making sure that the First Nations people get a voice and then we might learn from that how to get a voice ourselves. Terrific. Um, I've enjoyed the conversation with you both. I'm sure others too. I'm going to hand back to Stefan now to um, do whatever you're going to do next, Stefan. Thank you. Yes. Well, look, the biggest thing I'd like to do is to thank all three of you because that was fantastic. And I think Bill's actually left us with an action on this whole question of the voice and the upcoming uh, referendum and whatever we might be able to do individually or collectively on that issue, but it also kind of illustrates very well the whole, another way of um, coming at the whole YCW Cardine approach of involving people in their own lives from the beginning, not doing things for people. And I think Bill has just presented it um, so well, and I'm sure I haven't had a chance to read the book yet, but uh, I'm sure that's what comes out in the book. And if you look in the chat, you'll see the link where you can actually purchase the book and perhaps give it as Christmas presents to those who might benefit from it. Please, and please. Sure, yes, and I'm sure there are many people that would be, certainly benefit from it, judging by what we've heard tonight. And I'd really like to thank you too, Jean, for the fantastic way you facilitated this thing and brought out so many different aspects uh, of Bill's life and also the book. So thanks very much to all of you and thanks to everyone for joining tonight. And I'll take the opportunity to wish you all happy Christmas and uh, back to action in the new year. Thanks very much.